You're listening to TIP. Hey, how's everyone doing out there? On today's show, we're going to be covering billionaire Mark Cuban. Mark is a fellow Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania guy, and after attending college in Western PA, Mark moved to Texas and became a bartender and then started working in sales at a software company. But after being fired from his job in a short amount of time, Mark started his own company called Micro Solutions. After selling the business for $6 million in under a decade, Mark started a new business that streamed college sports over the internet. Within another decade, Mark sold Broadcast.com for $5.7 billion to Yahoo. During our show, we play some interesting questions that Mark has been asked about his time as an entrepreneur in building this billion-dollar enterprise. So without further delay, we hope you enjoy our coverage of billionaire Mark Cuban. You are listening to The Investor's Podcast, where we study the financial markets and read the books that influence self-made billionaires the most. We keep you informed and prepared for the unexpected. All right. Welcome to the Investors Podcast. Stig and I are so excited to have you here. And like we said in the introduction, we're going to be talking about Mark Cuban. So without any hesitation, we're going to cover the first question. This was whenever Mark was asked, let's talk about your first tech business, Micro Solutions. And this was his response. I got a job working at a software store in Dallas, Texas, selling computer software. And I didn't know a lot about computer software. So what I would do is I would come in early, stay late, come in weekends and sit there teaching myself all the different software. I mean, I literally would sit there and read software manuals. I taught myself how to program. I would go out and sell software to businesses or anybody really who wanted it. One day I had a big sale and it was at a company called Your Business Software. I worked for a guy named Michael Humecki. I went in and I said, Michael, I've got this big deal I'm going to close. I'm going to go pick up a $15,000 check. My commission was going to be $1,500. And mind you, I'm living in this three-bedroom apartment, six guys. I'm sleeping on the floor. I have towels that stand up on their own, you know? (laughs) It is just the grossest ever. So I'm thinking, yeah, I get to move. We called it the hotel. I get to move out of the hotel into a real apartment. And he says, no, it was a retail store. You have to make sure the windows are clean. You have to make sure the floor is swept and the displays are all. I said, Michael, I'm going to go close this deal. And he goes, no. And I'm like, I promised him, I got to go. I come back, he fires me. I take my check back, (laughs) put it in my pocket, and take that customer and go start a company called Micro Solutions. I really like his response. I think for anyone who's been following my Cuban, you know how big he is on sales. So that's really my key takeaway here. At the end of the day, everything comes down to sales. We have this idea that sales is the least prestigious job you can have. I don't see sales anywhere like that. For me, sales is the most refined art and the most important skill you can have in many, many ways in business. If you're applying for a job, you're a salesperson. If you're attracting an employee to a company, you're also a salesperson. If you want to persuade your boss or your colleagues that the company should run with your idea, you're in sales too. It just seems different whenever you're not knocking on doors trying to to sell your, your product. I think in this day and age where everything is about automation and AI, one skill I don't see go away anytime soon, that is the ability to sell. It's really the primary driver for everything in, in business when you, when you think about it. And whenever I listen to what Cuban said, I also came to think of other billionaires. Bill Gates, also a great salesperson. He sold his first piece of software before it was programmed. You could say the same thing about Warren Buffett, the way he got started, who was selling his partnership. I like that too. And the same with Mike Cuban. He got his validation of the concept whenever he received that check. It all comes down to sales at the end of the day. I completely agree with your point there, Stig. We'll go on to the next question. For people that don't know, Mark Cuban went on past this. He ended up buying an internet domain called broadcast.com. If you actually type in broadcast.com today into your web browser, it'll take you to yahoo.com. That's because Mark sold it to Yahoo. Just so people understand what broadcast.com was, he was going around and basically syndicating radio announcements of various sporting events. So if you wanted to listen to a certain football game or you wanted to listen to a baseball game, 
it was all being syndicated through broadcast.com early on when the internet was just being stood up before any of this kind of stuff was possible. So this was a question in reference to that sale to Yahoo. You sell and, and they pay you in stock. Yeah. And post sale, Yahoo struggles with the acquisition. They don't really know how to do well, it. No, no. Okay. So let, let's put it in context here, right? We sell the company and I don't remember the exact price of Yahoo stock. It was like $250. From my perspective, this was April of 2000 when it closed. Oof. And I don't see the stock market just going up forever. I mean, literally, the NASDAQ just passed 5,000, which is where it was back then in 2000. You know, like I said, I traded stocks, I had started and sold a hedge fund. I understood what happens in the market, and gravy trains don't last forever. And so I'm like, look, this is crazy. It's always been a little crazy, but it's getting even too heated. I had to wait six months before I could hedge my stock, meaning buy an offset in case it went down. So I literally took every penny I had, 20-some million dollars in cash, and I put against, on an index against the entire market. And that put was for six months. But if the market crashed prior to that, I was as good as I could be. The market didn't crash. I lost every penny. But <laughs> the minute I, I was allowed to, I hedged everything. Everything, right? Everybody thought I was an idiot. There's literally a CNBC interview where he said, Mark, don't you feel stupid? Yahoo stock is up another $100. And this, by this time, I'd already sold the Mavs. And I remember sitting on the team bus talking to our then coach and one of our coaches, Del Harris. And he goes, look at all that money you left on the table. And I'm like, literally in one day, the stocks were jumping so crazily. One day, I paid for the entire Mavericks in the stock move of one day. And they're like, but you left all this on the table. <laughs> and I'm like, patience, patience. I did an interview on CNBC, and he goes, don't you feel horrible that you left, you know, billion plus dollars on, on the table, and, and it's on tape? He goes, I said, yeah, I feel really bad flying around in my G5, you know, <laughs> just horrible. Um, but everybody thought I was an idiot. Even people who worked for me, I told everybody. And Todd listened. Some people did. Some people didn't. Because every single person who had worked for us for more than a couple months was, at least on paper, a millionaire. And that was 300 plus people. So we had a lot of smiley faces around the office. And I'm like, look. And they're like, oh, see, you were wrong. The stock's going up. And then the bubble burst. And it went, Pfft. it's unfortunate. A lot of people got crushed. Because I had hedged everything, I actually benefited in some respects and came out further ahead. From there, the problem with Yahoo and what happened afterwards wasn't so much what we were doing. It's once Yahoo stock went from 300 some dollars to $5 or something crazy, they freaked out. So this is a really interesting comment on many levels. The thing that I liked about it was he was really talking about this idea of getting the trade perfect versus getting the trade good enough. Although he talked about there the first six months with the stock not going the way that he thought, he had a much bigger idea of how to position himself for safety. This wasn't a position for making a ton of money. This was a position to protect himself when everyone was being greedy in the market. And we all know the Buffett saying, when everybody in the market was being greedy in 2000, Mark Cuban was trying to be very conservative, play it safe protect his investment. Really interesting how he was thinking about this. So many people, the people on CNBC asking him questions. You left money on the table. You left money. On of course, you're going to leave money on the table. To predict the top of the market or to predict anything of when it's exactly going to happen is a fool's errand. And you're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble trying to do stuff like that. It just has to be good enough. And I think that's what he was really saying. Stig, I'm curious what you've got on this one. I would like to talk a bit more about the strategy of buying put options. But my Cuban is really doing here, just to be sure, like we're we all on the same page, is he was paid in Yahoo stock. So if that dropped, he would basically just lose all that money. So he wanted to hedge that by buying a so-called put option. The way this works is very simple. If you buy a put option with a strike price of $20 and the underlying stock, say it's trading at 19, then you will have $1 in profit. That was really what he was thinking here. Whenever you are dealing with options, whenever you are buying, you cannot actually also be selling. But if you are buying 
in this situation a put option, you can still make multiples of what you put into it. So he put $20 million into it, but that is the premium. So you would pay a premium for the right to exercise an option at a given strike price. That was what he was doing. So if he was right, he would be making a lot of money, or you might say he would still be losing money on the Yahoo bet, but he would be gaining a lot of money on the in the premium. And also, whenever you talk about options, it's always about the market's expectation. So if everyone expects Yahoo stock to continue to go up in price, then the strike prices he could get as an investor would be really attractive if he had the feeling that it would go in another direction. The other thing I really like about this example is that a lot of people has been talking about Mark Cuban being being lucky and just selling at the right time. And why wouldn't you? Yahoo bought Broadcast.com just before the crash, almost before the crash. Of course, I'd say that there's an element of luck to all billionaires, or at least most of them. You know, I think this example shows a lot about Mark Cuban's financial literacy. He knows what he was doing. He was not trying to, well, he was actually trying to predict exactly when a crash would happen. But just that he was thinking in terms of hedging himself like that and being so active in the financial markets, I think this was a a very interesting conversation to have. If I was going to say he got anything wrong, I'd just say that the duration on the options is what he got wrong by doing six months. I've personally just had bad luck with short-term options, like anything under six months. Today, if I buy an option, it's always a two-year option. I'm sure there's a lot of financial people out there that could tell you why that's maybe not the best approach or whatever. But for me, I've just been so bad at forecasting time frame when something's going to happen that if I do feel pretty good about, hey, something's going to happen here pretty soon, like in the next six months, I usually give myself a two-year runway to see if that's true or not true. Uh, That's just my personal opinion on options. And I don't do put options on individual stocks at all. I refuse to go short on individual stocks. Now, I will short like an index using maybe like an inverse ETF or something, but I don't short individual companies simply because you have no idea who's going to maybe buy them out or what's going to come up that could drastically change whatever narrative you got on a specific company. And, and for me right now, Tesla would be a perfect example. I'm not a fan. I don't think Tesla's you know should be capitalized where it's at. So I think the price should go down, but I would never short that company. We've been running this show for like four years now, and we've probably been talking about Tesla being overvalued for what, three years or so. Exactly. We might have been right in the fundamentals, but we've been wrong about the timing if we kept buying six months puts, right? Absolutely. And you're right about the use by Mark Cuban here to protect all those shares he was receiving was an absolute smart decision. I just think maybe he should have done maybe a two-year kind of deal. And I'm sure he would tell you the same (laughs) today. (laughs) It's, It's easy to look back in time and call that one. Preston, I don't know if it was because he couldn't sell stock uh, after six months or after the acquisition was made or if that was yeah. why. I was thinking it was something like that because it seems like a short period of time for something like that. Well, I bet you that's probably what it was is he probably was protecting himself until he got to the point where he could just sell the whole position. Oh. Who knows? The next question that we're going to cover is when Mark was approached to do Shark Tank, all the opportunities that he was given with entrepreneurs and all that kind of stuff, this was his response. Mark Burnett put together in the United States, it actually is, the, is a concept that started in Japan and then went to the United Kingdom called Dragon's Den, and then Mark Burnett brought it to the U.S. and turned it into Shark Tank. I originally talked to him about it the first season, and they didn't cast me, and then I came back in the second season as a guest. And honestly, when I went on the show, they had bounced it around to different nights. And I'm thinking, this business show has got no chance of surviving. And so I go on there, do my three episodes as a guest, and I'm just buying every company no matter what. Because <laughs> I'm thinking, this thing's gone. And I, I'm like, I want to I make my mark on this TV show because this is ABC. It's network television. I'm, and Kevin and Damon and Barbara and Robert. They're looking at me like I'm crazy. It's just like when I went to the NBA, right? (laughs) They're like, what the hell are you doing? I'm like, you know, let's just have some fun. And the next thing you know, the show starts taking off and it really starts getting a base of viewers. And now we start next week, a week from today, we start shooting season 10. But along, yeah, which is cool. Could you imagine for me, eight seasons of Mr. Wonderful? It's brutal, brutal. But the good part about it is that so many companies have come on there and we've picked some and missed some. And I've invested, as you said, in 85, but 
I think now we're up to seven of those that have sold. We just sold a company out of Atlanta that went on Shark Tank as Cycloramic. They had the iPhone that used the buzzer and you ran this app on it and it just turned around and took panoramic pictures. Well, they changed the format of the iPhone, which is great. This is a great lesson for entrepreneurs, right? So this guy came in with this really cool app, worked with an iPhone 5, and it just turned around and take panoramic pictures and then stitch them together, and it was a cool picture. So I give him $250,000, I think, for 20% of the company or 25% of the company. Not four months later, Apple changes the iPhone, and it's got this, like, rounded thing underneath, and we're like, oh, what's, what are we going to do? But the guy was smart. And one of the things I always look for for companies coming in is what's your unique advantage? What is the one thing you have that differentiates you from other companies? And for this guy, the product was interesting, but you know, as I said on the show, the ability to program video and use what became computer vision was a unique skill that was hard to find. And so we worked with him and actually brought it, worked with him to bring in another CEO and they use that same technology to be able to scan cars. So now if you go to websites like Carvana to buy a car and you see how you can turn the car around just right there, that started with their software. And the guy's name is Bruno. So Bruno, we just sold his company for $22.5 million a couple of weeks ago. And so I walked away with you know, 25% of that. So I was like, yeah, Shark Tank. <laughs> Bring me some more Shark But the, the point of it is all these companies come on and There's some rules of thumb that I thought were smart going in, but have really turned out to be true moving forward. One is sales cures all. Lots of companies come in and say, I have a great idea, or I have a company, and we've got some sales, but we only need to do this, and we only need to do that. And you talk to the entrepreneur, and I'm like, why aren't you selling? This is your whole company. There's never been a company in the history of companies to survive without sales. Now, as more and more people watch Shark Tank, they're seeing it. But if you can't sell, if it's your company and you can't sell, you're not going to be in business long, particularly when you're starting up and it's just you. And so there are principles like that. You know, the other thing is when people get some momentum, they want to all of a sudden go big, right? Particularly that's kind of a dot-com thing. Let's buy our customers, raise a ton of money. One of my buddies, Howard Tallman, says it best. He goes, you got to nail it before you scale it. If your company doesn't work, making it big won't solve your problems. It'll just add to your problems. Another thing that we try to convey, or I've learned and try to convey to our Shark Tank companies, is that raising money always seems to be like the big thing to entrepreneurs coming in. Well, if I can only raise this money, raising money isn't an accomplishment, it's an obligation. The best equity is sweat equity. You know, what you can do and what you, seriously, if you're putting in the, if you're putting in the sweat and you're putting in the time and you're not out there raising money and you're grinding it out and you're hustling, so many companies, I mean, and to me, that's part of the problem of Silicon Valley. They're so all about raising money, raising money, and they forget. That just creates an obligation. And when I give you my money in Shark Tank, what is this just like, okay, here's your hundred grand, call me when you're, you know, you're not so busy. No, I gave it to you for a reason, right? And I, I have expectations, and I want, to, I want you to communicate with me. It follows a normal distribution. I've had some really great companies, and I've had just some pure-out idiots. Just, and it's almost like drafting, you know, in the second round of the NBA. Athletes will come in and just give you the best song and dance, and you think they've got it together. I had this one company, and they did these... I try to get people to paint their faces to come to Mavs games. And, you know, kids will put on paint, you know, but when you're done with it, it's a mess. And so this company, um, Game Face, they had these things. They got surgical tape, and they had them reformatted so that you could just cut it up, color whatever colors or pre buy the colors you like, and just poke the holes and cut them and put them on your face. And when you're done, you know, you look all Mavs colors or whatever. You just peel it off, and you're done. It was great. All of a sudden, one day, I'm getting a report. So the way I like to do it is I like to get weekly, depending on how good the company is, weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, or quarterly. You know, the better the company, the longer you can wait. But I always want bad news first. Because I I invested in you because I expect good news. But when there's a problem, I want to know about it because I want to be able to help you and get it through it. And so with Game Face, I got my reports, and all of a sudden, the money was gone. I'm like, what'd you spend all this money on? It's gone. And 
He decided we needed, for his surgical tape mask, he decided we needed patents all around the world to protect it. I'm like, dude, you've, you've barely sold anything. What are you protecting? There's no good reason to patent something that sucks. <laughs> but if you can't sell it, right, then you know it sucks. If you can sell it, then you can talk about it, right? But so in this case, it wasn't that it sucked. It was actually a good product, but the guy went through all of the money. I'm like, so what are you going to do now? I don't know. We'll start small. I'm like, look, we I got them together, sitting there drinking iced tea. I'm like, I'm going to do you a favor. I own 33% of the company. I'm going to take over and run it. All you have to, you can go get another job. You can hang out with your kids. I'm not going to let, you don't have to do anything. And please don't do anything. I've got my 33%. I think this can be big enough. Just seeing what I could see was going to sporting events and the World Cup was coming and things we could do there and selling sponsors. Just chill, right? Here's the beer. I'll send you beer. Whatever you need, just chill. <laughs> so we shake on it. And so um, we're grinding it out, right? And sales are going, and I'm like, okay, this is working. Six months later, I get an email from one of my guys. You're not going to believe what he did. I'm like, what did he do? He, he created his own newgameface.com or whatever it was to compete with me. I'm like, you know, look, as an entrepreneur, you guys are entrepreneurs. You've got to have a screw loose. You got to be a little freaky somewhere along the line. That's just the nature of the beast because it's so competitive and there's so much at stake. But <laughs> come on, man. It was just like, <laughs> so they run the gamut. So obviously a, a hilarious exchange here on some of his stories dealing with Shark Tank. The last one doesn't surprise me. How many, everyone is, who's listening to this has stories of people like this that just do not get it. They come up with a great idea. Just don't understand the business part of it at all whatsoever. I liked his comments about the, the patent stuff. There's so often people think they've just got to file a patent for everything and they're not cheap. They're really expensive, tens of thousands of dollars in most cases with patents. I've got a real quick tip on patents. If you ever have a really great idea and you want to license something, read this book called One Simple Idea. It'll save you a ton of money. It's basically how to file a PPA, a provisional patent for like a couple hundred bucks and then to go float the idea without having to spend all the money. And then once you get somebody to bite on the idea, you're able to have them pay for the patent and then you collect a royalty off of it. It's a great book, but not to deviate too far off of this. Really fun conversation. I didn't realize that about the beginning of Shark Tank with his first season where he was just basically trying to make as many deals as possible because he, he didn't think the show was going to make it. <laughs> That's pretty surprising. I didn't realize that. Yeah, absolutely love this exchange. Anyone who's been raising capital, they've been speaking to people who are just like, just don't get it and don't get really what it's all about. Uh, I was doing this consulting for this guy. It was probably a few years ago and, and he was trying to raise a few million dollars. Uh, it was about sponsorship for football clubs or something like that. I was going over his case at this point in time and he was, he was just standing up. like he, he still had a job on the side. So I asked him, so, so what is the money for? And he said, well, if I raise, I think it was $2 million, I can quit my job and hire a salesperson. That would be so nice. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, it would be nice if you could quit your job and, and hire a salesperson. But it's not a business. You are the salesperson. You are the business. What, what are you going to do? And just, really just to tie this back to what Mark Cuban was saying, this was in one of the other audio clips that we didn't do here today. He was talking about how he met up at 1 a.m. at night uh, when it was convenient for the buyer. It's not convenient whenever you try to raise capital. You don't raise capital because it's convenient for you. You do it because it's convenient for the investor. So if you raise $100 million, you have $100 million obligations. And the thing is really as simple as, as that. We started multiple billionaires here on the show who's been raising capital and who deeply regretted it, even though they had enough money already. Perhaps why, you know, Ted Turner started CNN whenever he was doing the, the merger with Time Warner. He regretted it, uh, Boone Piggins, uh, and just here lately, Elon Musk. 
Sure, there are a ton of things you can't do if you don't raise capital, but most people go into entrepreneurship because they do not want a boss. That is exactly what you're getting whenever you are raising capital. Nothing wrong with raising capital. It's not a freebie, as I guess some people might mistake it for. I absolutely love this point that you just made, Stig, because people become entrepreneurs because they don't want to have a boss. Then as they're in the grind and they're doing their thing, they're like, we got to raise money. We got to do a funding round because that's what everyone does it with this entrepreneur stuff. They raise money. They go out and get a million dollars. And I think they get caught up in that idea. And so they go out and they raise the money only to find out now, not only are they working for somebody else, but they're working for somebody else in probably the highest stress environment you could possibly create. All of a sudden, it isn't their baby anymore depending on how much equity you give up during the funding rounds. But you know, you go out and grab a, a million bucks from somebody, typically they want to have a, a control. There's just some thoughts. You know, If you are starting your business and you're talking that kind of stuff, we totally get it. We understand why you want to raise money because you want to move fast. But this is what I'll tell you. If you're trying to move fast just to move fast, you're setting yourself up for failure. If you're trying to move fast because you literally have people breathing down your throat that are trying to steal your market share, that's a whole nother thing. And it's probably something that you do need to do to stay alive. If your business is highly dependent on network effects, say you're in some type of software or something like that, if it's highly dependent on network effects and you got to be first to market and take the, the majority of the market share to really make it, then you do it. But if you're just going fast to go fast, uh, you're going to be working for the man and it's not going to be fun. So I'd just tell you, those are some important things to think about if you are in the startup land. This next question gets further into this idea of selling. This gets into the idea of taking responsibility and just overall mindset. And we thought that this was a really good exchange for people to listen to. So here it goes. Yeah. Being an entrepreneur is about being a problem solver, right? You're, you know, what is selling? Selling is not convincing. Selling is helping. You know, as tech entrepreneurs here, if you're going to a customer, whether it's a consumer or you're in B2B, you know, either you're making your customer's life easier, either you're reducing your stress or you're making it harder and you're increasing their stress. I mean, over the years, I think some of the things I've come to learn, particularly dealing with some of these Shark Tank companies, is one of the greatest skill sets that an, an entrepreneur, employee, salesperson can have is reducing stress. If you find that when you go to work, stress increases the minute you walk in the door, you've got a problem. If you have an employee and the minute they walk in the door, you have a problem and they have a problem. And what I've found is the best companies, the best employees that I have, the best investments that I have are the people who reduce stress because those are the people we don't want to give up. They don't make the most noise. They don't always get the biggest paychecks. They don't always close the biggest deals. But when there's problems that need to be solved, they're already working on them before you're even aware of them. If you set in your mind goals as an entrepreneur for your company, one, keeping your, you know, selling and keeping your customers very happy, two, staying ahead of the curve with your competitors, and three, reducing stress of everybody around you, all your stakeholders, you're gonna be successful. Because if you think about all your personal experiences, would you rather do business with somebody who creates stress or do you want to do business with the person who reduces stress? It's an easy answer, but you'd be amazed at how many people don't follow through on that. And then part two to that is nice is way undervalued. You know, particularly in this day and age, you know, if you turn on the news, everything seems like it's going to get blown up, right? Being nice just makes life so much easier. And look, I learned the hard way. I had to have my partner, Todd, came to me one day and he goes, I like to curse. He goes, I don't care about cursing, but you curse too much. Not everybody's as, as accepting as cursing as you are. Calm the f down. <laughs> <laughs> and I took that to heart, not so much the cursing part, but it became apparent to me that the nicer I got, the more effective people around me got the more productive they got, the more sales we had. I was undervaluing nice. I started my, my first company after I got fired from a job and I was 24, just turned 24. 
I was always go, 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 all consumed, right? Live it, eat it, sleep it, breathe it. And I knew people couldn't keep up or work as hard as many hours as me, but I wanted them to. And we were successful and we didn't have much turnover, but I could have done a better job if I were nicer. Broadcast.com, I, I got a little bit nicer, right? But then once I got to the Mavs and, and some of these other companies, and Todd reminded me, nice works. And so when you find yourself going to work, when you're finding yourself dealing with customers, when you're finding yourself making decisions, we all get that agita, right? That feeling in our stomach, that tenseness, that stress at various points of times that we all have to go through. But sometimes you just need to calm down, right? Take a deep breath and be nice. If you reduce the stress to people and you're nice, you're gonna have such a huge advantage. No matter what your technology is, no matter how it compares, even if it's a download for an app, people will still have to deal with you. Your culture will come through. Being nice, being, being supportive, reducing stress, that all comes through even in an app. This was such an awesome exchange. This idea of a person walking through the door and stress level going up versus going down. I wish you could have taken a screen capture of my face when he was talking this. <laughs> Because I, the look on my face was, thank you. Thank you for saying this because I've never been able to describe that idea in such a concise and accurate way. But I know from my own work experience, sitting in an office and a person walks in and it's just like, oh, thank God this person's here. They can pretty much solve anything and they're amazing. Or the feeling like, Oh my God, this person just walked through the door. What drama is about to be created right now? And what issue are they going to bring me with no solution? We all know who these people are. The thing that I think is really important for us isn't necessarily identifying who those people are in an organization, but how are we being perceived when we walk through a door? If you think it's because you're the low stress person, I would tell you just not to jump to the conclusion so quickly and uh, really think hard about that because maybe you aren't. Myself included, I think it's super important to really test that idea and to think about that idea because he's hitting on something that's way deeper than just stress. He's hitting on effective teaming. He's, he's just hitting on a whole range of topics there. And I love how he put that. One thing that was real subtle there at the beginning, he, he mentioned it briefly, was this idea of convincing people in sales versus finding a win-win and really kind of tailoring the solution to the person that is the potential buyer. Anyone who is a great salesperson is doing the latter and not the former. I've received so many sales pitches from people over the years that they come in and you can just tell it's canned. They're just spewing the, the routine, if you will. They're not necessarily trying to understand what it is that I need as the customer first, and then trying to tailor their pitch to those needs and those desires that I personally have. They, they've never even taken the time to try to understand what those things are. If you want to be effective at sales, that's where you always start and you really do your, your market research and try to understand who your customer is at a very fundamental level. And then you adjust your sales pitch to that. The thing that I really took away was the thing about stress. I guess, that, as you said, Preston, I've never been able to pinpoint it like that. It, it sounded so simple whenever he said that. Apparently not simple enough for me to, to grasp before. The way that I often look at working with other people is, are they problem identifier or problem solvers? Oh my God. God, I mean, there are 100 to 1 of people who are problem identifiers. I mean, this is wrong, and then that is wrong. And yeah, you know, there are so many things in life that's wrong, and that's just the way it is. What is the solution? If I have a person on the team that will come to me and say, this is the problem, I have identified two different solutions. Which one do you prefer? Here's the pros and here are the cons. That's a person who I would like to work with uh, because it reduces stress. Giving me the bad news first, as my Cuban is saying, and then two options to choose from, or even better, if that person just took care of it, you don't really pay attention to that. Oh my God, I, I love that. Unfortunately, I didn't have too many things to add. I just really wanted to play this question in case people were as oblivious as me in terms of increasing or alleviating stress and how that works in the workplace and whenever you are aiming to create win-win with the people around you. 
Well, we uh, enjoyed covering some of this Mark Cuban stuff. I could play a lot of his stuff all day long. I'm a big fan of his work. At this point, what we're going to do is we're going to transition to a question from our audience. This question comes from Colin, and here we go. Hi, Preston and Stig. So before I ask my question, I just want to say thank you to you guys for putting on the podcast. I listen to your show every Monday morning on my drive to work, and it's really helped me learn more about the world of investing and also the world of business as a whole. One of the common themes from your show is that many billionaires and business people believe the best way to create wealth and success is creating value for society and entering into win-win situations in terms of negotiating. Your podcast is an excellent way for the two of you to create value for society while focusing on what you love, which is investing in finance. On the other hand, investing in the stock market is a zero-sum game. So every time we make a good decision as investors, someone else has to be making a bad one and vice versa. My question is, how do you think about the stock market and investing in public equities as creating value for society? As a young person considering a career in space, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. I'm not sure if I could pursue a career where I'm the only one winning. Thanks again, Colin. Colin, I really like your question. I guess I look at it a little bit differently than the zero sum game kind of thing. I think if you're trying to strategically do something from like a quant standpoint, I guess I can see how people would maybe go in that direction. I look at it just like this. If I was going to go out and buy a business on Main Street, if I held that business for five years and I owned the entire thing and then I sold it to somebody else, I don't really necessarily see that as a zero-sum game. I see that as just me having a business interest, owning that business, selling it off to somebody else, and then me taking the capital and employing it any other way that I want if I want to own another business or whatever. The stock market's the exact same thing, only it's done on a micro level. And what's great is it allows people to take ownership in businesses that they could never afford if they weren't divided up into tiny little shares. Like you want to own Nike or you want to own Under Armour, you want to own whatever, you can own those businesses. You don't have to be a multi-billionaire to own those companies. If you want to buy that and hold it for 30 years, as if you know Buffett would tell you to buy something and hold it forever with a punch card of, of 20 picks, if you're investing that way, which we highly recommend that people invest this way, that's going to be beneficial. I think when the market starts to be treated as if you're not owning businesses, you're just doing things to trade pieces of paper that don't mean anything to try to turn a profit, that's whenever I think you turn from using the market what it was really intended for to something that's different. Maybe what you're describing as a zero-sum game. I would encourage people to think about the market in that regard, that you're owning a fractional piece of a business that you really have a belief or passion behind that you think is doing good for the world. And I think that you're going to find that your yields return when you start investing in companies that you really believe in and that you think are adding to uh, society's benefit. I don't know, Colin, if you refer to that being a zero-sum game, like the market will yield 7% for someone to gain 8%, another person would you know, have 6%. I don't know if that's how you look at it. And there's definitely some truth to that, and then you also have to pay commissions and, and other fees. But in terms of a zero-sum game, as it not making profit, you would still be better off as an investor, even if you unperformed the market by 1% instead of holding cash, simply because the stock market yield in the long run, that is all the listed companies, uh, all the profits that's distributed back to the owners. I look at the public market as playing an important role for society. Think about saving up for retirement. Your parents might have invested in stock and, and done so, say, 30 years ago, and now they're looking to retire. So they would sell off their stock and then buy a fixed income. And it might be some of the same stock that you want to buy being a new investor going to the market because you have another risk profile. So I, I think the stock market is really good at distributing utility across society. And then you just have some of the other important factors like uh, raising capital for companies to increase production, create employment, uh, generate tax income for society. Definitely, whenever you watch CNBC or whatnot, there's definitely dark sides to the stock market. But in general, I think it's a, it's a very good thing for any um, country to have in terms of creating wealth. Colin, I like this question. This is a really good question, and it forces people to really take a look at what is actually fundamentally happening. 
as a token of our appreciation for asking such a great question, we're going to give you access to one of our paid courses on TIP Academy. It's going to be our intrinsic value course where you can determine the value of a business. You can access this course at TIPintrinsicValue.com. That's TIPintrinsicValue.com. We just really appreciate you uh, calling in and leaving such a great question. For anybody else out there, if you want to get your question played on our show, go to asktheinvestors.com. There's a little button there where you can just hit record. It's the fastest thing ever. Uh, It's really easy to do, but just go to asktheinvestors.com. You can record your question, and if it gets played on the show, you can win a free course on our website. All right, guys, that was all that Preston and I had for this week's episode of The Investor's Podcast. We see each other again next week. Thanks for listening to TIP. To access the show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. To get your questions played on the show, go to asktheinvestors.com and win a free subscription to any of our courses on TIP Academy. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making investment decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the TIP Network. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting. 